Hi, Big Anklevich here to talk about the audio market list with my special guest, Mr. Sean Connery. Please, call me Sir Sean. Your mother certainly did. Uh, excuse me? Oh, I, I apologize. It must have been your sister. Right. Let's just talk about the audio market list, okay? Yes. There's something you can find at www.audiomarketlist.com. And it brings together the internet fiction markets who will air authors' work and podcast it in both paying and non-paying formats. Short stories, novellas, even poetry. Poetry? That reminds me of my favorite sonnet. There once was a man from Nantucket who is... Sean, is that really appropriate? It's Sir Sean to you, you sideburnless alewife. <sighs> Look, just read the copy, okay? No need to get snitty. The audio market list also includes links to writing workshops, author associations, podcasts on writing, and even genre conventions, with many ladies to be had. Keep to the script. The audio market list won a truly useful site award from predators and editors, and it is the first and largest market list exclusively dedicated to audio fiction. It includes frequent updates about contests, new markets, and newsworthy notes from fiction audio sources. And it's free, with no membership required. You know what else is free? Or perhaps I should say, who else is free? <sighs> Check out the Audio Market List on the web at www.audiomarketlist.com. Uh, say it with feeling, you big sissy. You know, I don't even think you're the real Sean Connery. Your Aunt Constance didn't complain. Please leave. That's usually my line. Followed by, the money's on the dresser. <laughs> You're listening to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now, Rish Outfield, Big Anklevich, and OHOT. Happy New Year! Welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 2, number 3, page 4. Wow. I'm Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Announcer Man. And the Big Announcer Man. Yep. So, welcome to our first show of the new year. Hope you had a uh, wonderful turn of the decade. Already? Yeah, isn't that freaky? Yeah, I mean, I, it sucks to get old. You should see my n hair. Oh, what? <laughs> That's one thing we don't want to see. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so we have a story today. No. Yes, we do. Unlike last week or the week before, <clears throat> today's story is Walkin' After Midnight by C.S. Fuqua. Walkin' After Midnight was first published in the October 1990 edition of Figment magazine, and then reprinted in Daw Book's Year's Best Horror Stories 19, edited by Carl Edward Wagner. C.S. Fuqua's published books include Big Daddy's Gadgets, The Swing, Poems of Fatherhood, and Notes to My Becca, among others. His shorter works have appeared in a range of publications, including Brutarian, <laughs> Dark Regions, <laughs> Christian Science Monitor. <laughs> Pearl, The Writer, and Honolulu Magazine. <laughs> and special thanks to Julie Hoverson for lending her voice to today's episode. Walking After Midnight by C.S. Fuqua. The tools in back clanked and rattled as the truck's front tire edged off the road onto the bumpy shoulder. Jeremiah's head nodded, bounced. He jerked straight, arms rigid, snatching the wheel, swaying the truck back onto the highway. His muscles began to twitch uncontrollably. He'd nearly hit a hitchhiker, someone who looked familiar. Too familiar. He stopped, shifted into reverse. But when he backed to the point where the truck had left the road, the hitcher had disappeared. Probably figured I'd try again. 
He drew a steadying breath and wiped away tiny droplets of sweat that had popped out above his lips. He put the truck in first and drove on. Rain streamed down in tinfoil strips as the windshield wipers whacked steadily side to side. And soon, Jeremiah again felt the monotonous rhythm lulling him towards sleep. He slapped his face, shook his head. I'm getting too old for this. He steered the truck into the parking lot of a small grocery store, closed for the holiday. A Santa Claus grinned from the doorway. He punched off the lights, switched off the engine, closed his eyes. And though he'd stopped here simply to catch a nap, without the monotony of the road and the wipers, sleep became impossible. He twisted out of the seat and stepped into the rear of the truck. Maybe straightening his tool stock would at least get his blood pumping enough to keep him awake until he got the truck home. After midnight, he mumbled bitterly. But the words conjured up a smile. In his mind, Bessie smiled back. She had loved country music, but no artist better than Patsy Cline. And though she couldn't remember the words, she used to hum one song relentlessly, the tune Jeremiah's grumbling had brought to his own lips now, Walking After Midnight. The frigid breath of December whispered in through door cracks. A half-century of pushing wrenches to service station owners, to hardware store operators, to anyone, to everyone. Jeremiah had worked for three companies, none with a retirement program. Yet Bessie had begged him to retire ten years ago. We can live on Social Security. But a man and a woman, he argued, can't buy much of a life with peanuts. Still Bessie pleaded, and finally Jeremiah said okay. He'd give up the road and come home to putter. Then Bessie had to go and have that heart attack just two days before he was to give notice. Girl said you were going to quit. I was, baby, but I got no reason now. Living alone ain't much of a life. But you're not alone, Grandpa. You have us. On weekends, Missy? I can't live my life on weekends. A crescent wrench clinked against pliers in Jeremiah's quivering hands. Bessie had lived her life on weekends. The rain gradually hardened, grew into sleet that battered the roof. Wind whistled under the doors. Jeremiah cupped his hands around his mouth and blew as he started for the front. He crawled into the seat behind the big wheel and cranked the engine, remembering how Bess used to wait up until he got home, no matter how late. He peered into a night he had not seen the likes of in a good twenty years. Last time the rain had turned to sleet this early in the season this far south, the government had called about his son. Jeremiah's truck pulled onto the deserted highway, headlight beams driving deep into the mercury slick sleet. Another hour, he'd be home. For the weekend. Clop, clop. The windshield wipers did their job, allowing thin sheets of ice to form only around the edges where the defroster could not make itself useful. The road passed in hypnotic streaks of white. Clop, clop. Sarah says you got someone else on your route, Jerry. She laughs. laughs. You believe everything Sarah says? If I did, I'd have left you a long time ago. No one laughs. They lie in darkness until one of them, they never remember which one, kisses the other, and they bring their bodies together, caressing, lingering. Clop, clop. Jeremiah's head bobbed. A whisper. Jerry! He gasped, snatched himself erect, and yanked the wheel, bringing the truck weaving center road. He glanced around, his eyes filling. That voice. He'd heard it a million times in dreams, conjured it up a million times more in memory. But this time, so real. In the fringe of the headlight beam, someone waved from the ditch. Jeremiah wrenched around for a better look, but the image was gone. A mirage, a senile old man's wish image. He shook his head sadly at his mistake. First it goes the mind, then the body. Bess had said that. Used to call him crazy when he'd sneak up behind her in the kitchen and race icy fingers under her dress and clamp his hand to her thigh. She'd scream like a psychotic killer and chase him through the house with spatula in hand, dripping spaghetti sauce down her arm. Then he'd spin around, catch her in a bear hug, and they'd kiss and fall on the couch, tangling around each other, forgetting the meal on the stove. And when they would finally sit down to dinner, he'd laughingly sop up as much as he could hold, all the while saying, Charcoal's good for you. 
First it goes the mind. It was a joke back then. But hearing and seeing things that just aren't there isn't funny at all. Too distracting. Too discomforting. If Jeremiah didn't face the inevitable, on one of these late-night, long-route drives, he'd find himself in the ditch, in waist-high weeds, a man in army fatigues, his hands cupped at his mouth as if holding a harmonica. Bill? Jeremiah slammed his foot onto the brake pedal and immediately realized his mistake. Never an accident in his career, and now the very night his mind starts to go, he destroys his perfect driving record. The truck broke into a dreamlike skid. By the time his body began to respond, the dreamy skid had flipped into a nightmare roll. Wrenches clattered and banged from their bins. Jeremiah felt himself rise into darkness. He heard the crash from far away, a tiny sound, a pin dropping. Then gradually, he drifted back, back could hear the steady rain of sleet on steel, the clop-clop of windshield wipers, the hiss of water on a hot engine. Jeremiah raised his head and groaned. Crystals of freezing water dripped in from somewhere above. He touched his forehead, winced, pulled his fingers away. In the dim dashboard light, he could see blood. First the mind, he mumbled, then the driving record. He raised up on one arm, got his bearings. The truck had come to rest on its side, about twenty feet off the road. And for what? A trick of the mind, the image of a man who died twenty years ago in someone else's war. Jeremiah sat up, bracing himself against the driver's seat. He got to his knees and checked his forehead in the rearview mirror. A superficial cut, more blood than wound. Clop, clop. Jeremiah clicked off the ignition. The wipers fell dead. He cut the lights. Sleet sliced against the truck, clung to the frame in freezing fingers. Jeremiah shivered, pulled his coat from the back of the seat, and slipped it on. You can't drive today. There's ice on the bridges all over the road. You'll kill yourself. Guess I'm stuck here, then. She grins, begins unbuttoning his shirt. I guess so. Jeremiah's teeth began to chatter as he sat there trying to decide what to do next. If only someone would pass on the highway. But that was unlikely. He hadn't met another car in more than an hour. Weather's gonna play havoc with business this winter. The sleep began to ease as Jeremiah scraped his hand across the windshield and peered into the night. The darkness possessed an odd metallic glow, and he could see tiny flakes of white intermingling with the waning sleet. Jeremiah's eyes warmed with the sight. He sniffled wiped his nose on his wrist. She shudders and snuggles closer. Her breath is a feather stroke on his neck. The sky is pewter through a window freckled by snowflakes. He thinks she is asleep, until her fingers begin a slow walk down his stomach. Her lips tickle his ear. She hums softly, that same old song about walking after midnight. Before the army, Bill sometimes accompanied her on harmonica. But today she hums unaccompanied, as she slides onto Jeremiah. The snow falls into a silent, gentle drift on their bedroom windowsill. Jeremiah stood up shakily, his knees tight with age and arthritis. Worse every winter. He moved them in a circular motion, loosening up, then climbed onto the shelving to work his way carefully to the rear. He flung open the back door, and the wind sang over him, chilling, yes, but somehow a relief from the feeling of being trapped inside. He lowered himself to the soggy soil, then pulled his collar tighter. The sleet had stopped completely now. Snowflakes gathered in his hair, settled on his eyebrows. A thin blanket of white had begun to spread on the highway. He struggled up the bank, slipping once, then started walking in the direction from which he'd driven. He'd passed a couple houses since leaving the grocery, but he couldn't recall how far back those houses lay. Didn't matter. They were back there, and he needed a phone. Might as well get started. With luck, someone would drive by and give him a ride. Then he'd call for a tow, call the cops, call his boss. That would satisfy all the requirements. So what if the last guy to wreck a truck got canned? So what if that man had been with the company two years longer than Jeremiah? What are you supposed to do? Drive in the snow? Even the plows won't get through this mess. She nuzzles closer and nibbles his neck. And this'll give me a couple more days with you. The phone rings. 
She groans playfully, oh. answers, Hello? A moment's silence. Then she whispers, Thank you. Cradles the receiver and holds him tighter. He feels the warmth of her tears, the mucus she can't stop. B -b -b Billy's missing. Two days later, the uniformed men arrive at the door of Jeremiah's daughter-in-law. Jeremiah is on the road, trying to make up sales loss because of the early snow, when Cindy comes to Bessie and tells her that Billy is no longer missing. All that's left of Jeremiah's son is a medal, a flag, a set of dog tags, and a body. No one knows what happened to the harmonica that Cindy gave him their first Christmas together, the harmonica he played when Bessie sang. Charlie probably took it for the gold. Jeremiah raised his face to the sky. Snowflakes settled on his brow and melted into tiny streams down his face, mixing with tears to soak the collar of his jacket. The winter wind that had earlier robbed the truck of its warmth had calmed now. Snow settled around him in a soft crackle, a swish. Jeremiah felt as if he could lie down here, draw the white cover around himself, and wait until someone, anyone, came by. Then why don't you? came a voice from behind. Jeremiah caught his breath and spun around. When he saw the man, Jeremiah's mouth went slack. The man wore no jacket, only army-issued camouflage pants, shirt, and boots. A purple heart dangled from his helmet. The man glanced up, following Jeremiah's stare at the medal. Best place for it. I'm a hero, you know. Jeremiah's eyes glittered in the pale night glow. Mucus streamed from his nose. Grandpa, Grandpa! The youngest ones killed a thousand Charlies in the backyard. Now his machine gun dangles silently off one shoulder. Grandpa, I saw Daddy! Jeremiah folds the newspaper, lays it on the floor... He slides to the edge of the chair and pulls the wide-eyed boy between his knees, his speckled hands on the boy's shoulders. His voice cracks. Your mommy already explained about your daddy. You know he won't be coming home. The boy twists in the old man's grasp. But I saw him. I saw him. Jeremiah shakes the boy. Stop it. Your father's dead, Tommy. He's dead. The boy wrenches free, shatters the plastic machine gun against the door jam as he flees the room. Jeremiah buries his face in his hands. B Billy? In the flesh. Well, almost. The man replied, <laughs> chuckling. Jeremiah swallowed. Felt his mouth grow as dry as sandpaper. First to go is the mind. The young man in uniform laughed again. <laughs> then the body. Isn't real. Just my mind. Jeremiah turned away and started down the road. First to... Uh, Dad? His son's voice called. Jeremiah slapped his hands over his ears. His lips trembled. Tears rolled down his face. But he kept walking. Then softly, pleadingly. H how's Cindy? The kids? That was all Jeremiah could take. His body began quaking uncontrollably. One more step, he knew he'd collapse. Don't you know? He whispered. The young man's image shimmered. Snowflakes drifted straight through. Once. I tried once. Replied the man. Now I wish I could let her know. The image faded completely. The old man reached out weakly, croaking. Son? A second later, the young man rematerialized. But his clothing had changed from army camouflage to jeans, a western shirt, a cowboy hat, the way he dressed the day he left home. A harmonica glittered into his hands. He raised it to his lips. But when the young man began to play, Jeremiah heard more than the harmonica's music. He heard the humming of a woman. Then he saw her emerging from the shadows behind the young man. A lump grew so large in Jeremiah's throat, he was certain he'd choke. His knees wobbled as the woman approached her arms beckoning. And then he felt those arms surround him. He buried his face in her hair, sucked in her musky aroma, savoring. The flesh of her lips pressed against his neck. Her breath felt hot and moist on his skin. The harmonica whined softly. And the woman hummed the old song about walking a highway after midnight, lonesome, hoping that somewhere he was searching for her. Jeremiah raised his eyes. The young man was gone. 
Bess? The woman put a finger to his lips. She took his head in her hands, spreading her fingers like webs, and slowly pulled him down, down, until they were lying on a bed of white, as warm and as soft as their bed at home. A delicate blanket settled over them, and Jeremiah drifted as lightly as a snowflake. Sam Posner pulled his sunglasses off and squinted. In sunlight, snow always appeared ten times brighter. He opened the squad car door, stepped into the driveway. Some guy in a tow truck, looking for a few extra bucks on Christmas Day, had nearly run over an old man's body not ten feet from this drive a little past daybreak. The trooper climbed the steps of the house, knocked on the door. A few seconds later, a tiny, gray-haired woman appeared. Yes, she had heard something during the night. Sounded like music. But I guess it was the wind. I looked out, but all I saw was snow. Officer Posner thanked the woman for her time and climbed into the squad unit. He backed the car out of the driveway and, with a sigh, headed for town. Now came the hardest part of the job, informing the next of kin, the old man's widowed daughter-in-law. Maybe the dead man's few personal belongings would soften the moment. A wallet, some change, a pocket watch and a gold harmonica. Author's Note Walking After Midnight first appeared in the late 1980s in a small, now defunct magazine called Figment. The title, which I took from the Patsy Cline song by the same name, later caught the eye of Carl Edward Wagner, editor of Daw Book's Year's Best Horror Stories. I'm glad that Carl was a Patsy Cline fan and that the title caught his eye because, more than landing a spot in that year's edition of Year's Best Horror Stories, Walking After Midnight proved to be the start of a brief professional friendship that ended abruptly with Carl's untimely death in 1994. Another of my stories, A Child's Eyes, loosely titled after one of Cline's songs, is dedicated to Carl and available on the web from Unseal Press as an ebook download. As for Walking After Midnight, it will appear again in print form in late 2010 in a collection of my stories to be published by Mundania Press. For more information about my work, and perhaps to help out with the groceries, please visit my website at www.fluteflights.com slash csfuqua. Thanks very much for listening to the story. I really hope you enjoyed it. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed your ride. Okay, dial it down about all oh, the way. Sorry. I was trying to be peppy. You're supposed to be peppy when you're a host. You're supposed to have energy. Uh, you know, I never read the manual, to be honest. <laughs> so, that was the story. How many stories have we done with an old man protagonist? Uh, we've done a few. The, the reason I was going to ask you is, do you have a particular love for old man protagonists you would think i have a love for old man protagonists and gargoyle stories considering how many times we've had each but it just happenstance it's just chance that we've come across good stories that are old man protagonists or have gargoyles i think you have the uh particular love for old man protagonists don't you i yeah i think so i think for some reason that really speaks to me, or I... Is it because of your nut hair? <laughs> I'm sure we cut that out. Um, at the same time, I'm also quite fond of stories with old women in them as well. Mostly because Scary I'm afraid. Yeah, I'm afraid of old women, and I revere old men, hmm. which probably makes me a bad person. But yeah. you already knew that, there, right? Yeah, Our listener all... already knew that too, Yeah, right? I think we all knew that you were a bad person okay. long before... Such gender-based discrimination came out in the open. Okay. The the title obviously comes from a Patsy Cline song because the author told us that. <laughs> and because it's in the story and because you tracked down a harmonica version of that. <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, I mean, it would have been cool if I could lie and say that Big played the harmonica just so that we would have that. But no, he, no, but he tracked down one. Which I think worked out really well for the story. You know, if it had been on the xylophone, yeah, it just wouldn't have, wouldn't have worked out. 
And now this is a weird thing. I have no experience with Patsy Cline in any way. Really? Even crazy. I'm crazy for... Oh, you've never heard that song? Never heard a single song from her. I've never heard the... Uh, the you only know the Julio Iglesias version or... Gnarls Barkley was the crazy. Oh. <laughs> I remember when. I remember when I lost my mind. Uh. Do the warning thing. Warning. Today's episode contains singing. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, it is the new year. Do you think I should resolve to not sing in any more episodes? <laughs> you might as well make it every other because it's really unlikely that you'll never sing again. You know, okay, a, a resolution that I am going to make right now in the middle of our discussion is I'm going to try to put the warning at the beginning of the episode <laughs> instead of after I've already sang, okay? All right. Do you have any love uh, or experience with Patsy Klein or bestiality for that matter? Not so much with bestiality, but uh, yeah, I don't know Patsy Cline well. Obviously, I'm old. she has passed away. Yeah. We're old farts, but we're not quite that old. We we, we lived through the eighties, I should say. So uh, Patsy Cline was already old and gone by then. But you know, you 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 hear it, and I've seen several films where the song comes up. Walking after midnight. Walking after midnight or crazy, I think much more. I really enjoy the songs. Both of them, I think, are great songs. I don't know anything else of hers, though, I don't think. You know, I bet if we heard some of her songs, we would recognize them, maybe not by the that's, titles. That's probably but true. But yeah, it's just she's one of those old go-to artists to evoke a certain feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's yesteryear, it's small town, it's America, m more southern or Midwest than... Yeah, it's like the, kind, the song that would be playing in the diner in the small town... Yes, When you definitely. walk in uh, Nebraska, kind of a thing. So yeah, this guy selling his tools across the... Uh, the heartland, let's the say. The heartland, there you go. Yeah, it, it really fits with it. That's, that's a, I think, a really cool thing about music is you can do that. Just mentioning a song is all it takes to set a certain mood. I, it's weird, this is kind of a tangent, but just the power of putting a song, a pop song, or just a song uh -huh. into a movie or a commercial or a trailer in the right hands you can get something powerful you yeah. can get tiny dancer in almost famous where present company excluded <laughs> everybody until the day i die will think of almost famous when they hear that song uh bohemian rhapsody at the beginning of wayne's world right in the middle with you uh reservoir dogs one of these moments yeah. where it's suddenly inextricably linked to a moment in a film. You, you mentioned commercials. There was that commercial for, I want to say, Metal Gear Solid. I don't remember what the video game was exactly, but where they played the cover of that Tears for Fears song. What, who was it that did the cover? You know the name of them, don't you? The, uh, the Dreams in Which I'm Dying are the Best I've Ever Had, that song? Yeah. That, That's that called Mad World. Mad World, the one by Gary Jules <laughs> that was in that. Uh, of course, we cut out 15 minutes of us saying, <laughs> uh, the guy's name is I, something. <sighs> it was, yeah, but it that. Was, it was done by Jewel, I know. Yeah, the funny thing is, I think most people that have ever heard that song heard it from that commercial first. The combination of the visuals from that commercial with this song it was it's, beautiful. Yeah, it seemed like it shouldn't fit because it was a really morose and sad song. And we're talking about some kind of sci-fi alien war. This guy fighting gigantic spiders and crab beasts or whatever these things were. And yet it was just really powerful. I saw that commercial and wound up going out and getting that song. And I know that many other people did because when I searched on the internet to find out what the song was... It was like one of those auto fill-in type things, you know. I start writing video game, commercial, and bam, that's what came up. So tons of people did that. I had no idea that it was even a Tears for Fears song. I've since heard well, it. Well, the but... Tears for Fears song actually sounds almost nothing oh, like Oh, yeah, it. it's a very it's much different... more upbeat, even yeah. though the lyrics, if you think yeah, about Yeah, the lyrics are the um, same. And I think I, I learned that song from Donnie Darko. Okay. But they're at the very beginning of Donnie Darko, the good version... They play uh, Killing Moon by Echo and the Bunny Man. And that's one of those moments where I will always think of the beginning of Donnie Darko. I'm not even a fan of Donnie Darko, <laughs> but I will always think of right. the opening of that when I hear that song just because it was so well done. When I took a music appreciation class when I was in college, the teacher talked about 
certain songs, you know, classical music pieces. And he would play one, and then he would ask people where they'd heard that. And it's always a Looney Tune, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was like Looney Tunes, or it was like, oh, yeah, on the episode of uh, I Love Lucy, where they're stomping the grapes or whatever. Or, oh, that's the song from the Scrubbing Bubbles commercial, or, <laughs> you know, whatever it was. Everybody had heard them from something else. And, you know, this, the same thing just came I was watching Up with my kids today. The first scene when uh, he gets out of bed, this first scene after the whole intro of oh, Carmen of his life, yeah, the song from Carmen comes on, and he gets up, and that whole da 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 da, da is playing as he does his stuff, and I was just thinking as I watched that, like you know, this may be one of those moments that my kids, you know, they'll know that song when you they and I get. I think of Bugs Bunny. Right. And they yeah. will think of uh, the Barber of Seville. But, <laughs> but yeah, my kids have recently been watching uh, Looney Tunes cartoons, so they're becoming familiar with those associations as well. All those really old songs, and even, you know, just songs that you were born after their time, you tend to become familiar with them when they're on some movie or something like that. Well, okay, like when I was a teenager. Stand By Me came out. Right. And suddenly that song was everywhere again. And I'm I'm fairly sure a lot of people wouldn't ever have heard that song had Probably, it not been yeah. brought back for that movie. And the next year, uh, they did, made the movie La Bamba. Oh, right. And that was, well, it was the Los Lobos version, but that was everywhere. Yeah. And I don't think I ever would have heard the Richie Valens version yeah. or cared about that song had it not been. Along with some of the other songs that they played in there as well. They did like, Oh, Donna and... Some of the other songs. Yeah, of, I uh, think of Lou Diamond Phillips in the phone booth mm-hmm. whenever I hear O'Donna. Uh, and, and that's that's appropriate. I, I mean, a gigantic one from my formative years was when Ghost came out and they used Unchained Melody right. during the pottery scene. or And again and again throughout that damn movie. Um, <laughs> but, I and mean, for my generation... Oh, that was our senior prom theme. Was it? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, my I had a friend that was so into that song for some reason. I just wanted to hit him. Oh, well, I, <laughs> I, I shan't tell you my affection for that song. Okay. Yeah, but it's it, just it one unfortunately of those spoiled any affection that I could have possibly had for it. Well, you know, that's something that is linked with it, and that's something I started to say at the very beginning. In the wrong hands or negative experience or with repetition – Certain songs tend to sour. I'm, I'm trying to think of a, a movie or a commercial or a TV show or something that ruined a song. You, the listener, probably can think of some right now because you're not on the spot. Like, Everything I Do, I Do It For You was such a massive hit. Right. Summer of 91. I mean, I don't think that you can have a hit that big today because of the fragmentation of of the charts and the fact that nobody buys music like uh titanic theme same thing comes to mind with that song that was okay. endlessly played on all right the radio. well you know that's that's very fair and yeah titanic that's something that we talked about when we saw avatar was right. will there ever be a hit uh, movie like titanic again and and the answer is i don't know but uh with uh, the brian adams song holy cow i loved that song you know, spinning around in my room, imagining I was dancing with what's her name. It was it was this this all consuming. Wow, I love this song, and it was a memento for that time period in my life. And that, and honestly, dude, I cannot <laughs> listen to that Can't song to it anymore. I, I I won't go as far as to say that I hate that song. I just won't listen to it. And I know there are probably no exaggeration. Millions of people that won't listen to my heart will go on. Yeah, I'm one of them. Can't. I can't stand that song. And I didn't like it much to begin with. Oh, problem. Okay. I ate that song. It was all right, but not a Celine Dion fan to begin with. And they start playing it over and over again, you will very quickly want to kill anyone that mentions or plays now, or whatever. You talked about uh, your music appreciation class. Uh-huh. That fascinates me. What the hell is a music appreciation <laughs> class? And. Did they cover what we're talking about now, the opposite, misusing music or pounding it into the ground? Or what? what is a music appreciation class? You had to write papers on a song and why it touches you or moves you or it the was, of it? It was basically more of a history of music, you might want to say, pretty much a classical music appreciation class. 
Oh. I think they didn't figure that they needed to teach you to appreciate rock and roll because everybody already did. I mean, we learned about what time period was the Baroque music period, what was the classical period, what was the romantic period, the modern period, etc. Yeah, it wasn't the kind of thing that you might think of where it's writing papers about why a pop song moves you or something like that. It was mostly learning the kind of things about music that you wouldn't learn otherwise but it was really interesting and i'm a big fan of classical music anyways and especially soundtrack music which is basically the classical music of our day i mean there's not maybe there is i don't know but it doesn't seem like there's much many people out there writing uh, symphonies and whatnot if you're a classical composer you go into making film scores it seems i don't know i believe mr holland wrote a rather famous <laughs> I'm sorry, I was going to interrupt you about eight times with, like, snoring sounds. and man, You asked, but... so I answered. You can cut most of it out and make it very short. <sighs> yeah, I was really tempted to mention nut hair again there, just to, oh, <laughs> in case people oh, were falling asleep. Man. You people are pigs! So in all this uh, music appreciation class, uh, c the conversation, there was never any mention of Taylor Swift? Uh... Well, uh, it was a while ago that I took that class. I think Taylor Swift had still not yet been born at the time. She is like 12 years old, right? So there was no point that they said, there's a very talented three-year-old out there. And <laughs> no. She's written some great little tunes. Unfortunately, they all end with the same line that the song began with. But she's three. I think we can forgive <laughs> that. that. I think that was the last chapter. We didn't manage to get to that chapter of the book, unfortunately. Well, that's okay. At least you covered Wang Chung. And yes, you know, we did. We did. Very in-depth. Spent two weeks on them, as far as I can remember. Oh, uh, this is all tied back to Walking After Midnight. Yeah. Now, uh, before we talk about the story again, instead of whatever the devil we were just talking about, <laughs> you know that my big thing in all of my writing <laughs> is to name stories after songs. Yeah. Whether it... Has anything to do exactly, with it or not. And that is the biggest crutch for me, I think. <laughs> it probably used to be first person. It was a great crutch because mm -hmm. it meant none of my characters had to know anything. Uh huh. But now it's just the damn song title thing. Yeah, there was a point where I actually uh, tried to come up with some song title names to go along with some stories that I wrote. Just, just to spite just me? To, yeah, just to fit in. Um, I wanted to be cool like you, and so I was like, well, I could call this story Everybody Wang Chung tonight, but it just didn't work. Although I think I still have a story where I'm kind of holding out. Holding out it? for a hero? No, it was Love Walks In, I think it was a Van Halen song that I was thinking of naming the story. But I don't know if that title's even going to fit. We may have to bag it. It'd be the last vestige of me trying to be cool like Rish, just going down the toilet. You know who else does uh, song titles? For stories mm. mary higgins clark if you've uh, ever seen any of her books my wife's a big fan and all of her books are song titles yeah i found that interesting at one point and then i realized that mary higgins clark sucks like you oh, why? <laughs> you built me up and then you knocked me down. Yeah, see what I did there? That, I, that's skillfully rendered, sir. There you go. <laughs> you like that? Okay, so I'm sorry. Back to the story at hand. You know, a few years ago, I, I really only shared my stories with one person. And he one time mentioned, like, I'm noticing that a lot of things keep happening in the stories that you write. You know, I'm going to challenge you to write a story. And they said, and it can't have this, and it can't be this, and it can't do this. And I was just like, well, uh, uh, so I don't know. I, uh, maybe I should try not to write stories with song titles anymore. And do you think that we as, as a podcast should declare a moratorium on old man stories? I don't think we need to do that. Maybe if our listeners want to make a comment and say, yeah, hell no, I don't want any more friggin' old man stories, then maybe. That, that would really bother me if somebody said that. Though. But I don't think that we need to do that. I think... As has always been our criteria for picking stories is just stories that we like, stories that are good. Doesn't matter whether it's a horror story, whether it's a sci-fi story, fantasy, whatever, steampunk. Western. Western. Fantasy Western. Horror Western. Straight up, plain old John Wayne Western, whatever, you know. If it's a good story, we, we go with it. And I don't think we should change that. Oh, no, okay, I, I, I hear you. Whether it just happens to be another old man, well, then that's just the way the dice roll. And I'm sure someday 
we'll go a year without you know without or without a single story. episode. <laughs> Yeah, well, either there was there was another podcast that we used to listen to, and uh, when they first started, every other story probably was really, really scatological, <laughs> and I felt like I had a perfect story for that <laughs> podcast. So I sent it to them, and we got a response that said, "Hey, we uh, we liked your story, and normally we probably would run it, but we're trying not to do any more stories of a scatological nature." And it, he said it with that strange accent, too, which, yeah. which struck me because I didn't think that that could be conveyed in text. But I digress. Apparently, that's all this has been is a digression. Yeah, pretty much. That's OK. Go on digressing. OK. Every podcast out there probably tries to get their niche or, or get their style or something where people can. I, I Sometimes when we were send out stories to readers they would say, this feels like a Dune Steve story. Uh -huh. And that impressed me. I'd be like, wow, so we have a certain style Apparently here? Apparently so, yeah. Or lack thereof. Enough so that people would say, this is a good fit for you guys. Or people would say, I'm, I like this story, but I'm not sure that it's a good fit for you yeah. guys. Yeah, and that's one thing that I tried to truthfully avoid somewhat. I mean, there's no way to avoid picking the stories that we like versus stories that we don't like. You but know. what did you try to avoid? But I tried to avoid being too stuck into a niche, if you know what I mean. Like, for example, the first podcast that I ever listened to was Escape Pod. And at the time that I started listening to it, Podcastle didn't exist yet. So if something was a fantasy story, then it would also play on Escape Pod. They had already broken off Pseudopod. But as they further divided themselves into their little, you know, we only do this, we only do this kind of niches, it seemed like a lot of the time, if you would went to their discussions or whatever, they would say, this story wasn't sci-fi, it was fantasy. And that was the discussion, was whether it fit into the category or not. Well, see, I, I loved it when you'd get a horror story and then you get a sci-fi story yeah. you get a fantasy story you get something that was a combination and you never really knew what you were going to get yeah i like that so much better too and that's why i say that i tried to avoid ever getting into a niche and saying oh we're a horror story podcast only even though you love horror stories and it's like your favorite thing and you've mentioned it again and again we don't only do horror stories and i tried to avoid that as much as possible and if there ever came a time that you know we became like a skate pod where we thought we could do more stories and so should we offshoot another podcast i wouldn't do it instead we would just do two stories a week and uh, we would still have that Russian roulette style where you don't know what you're going to get next story. Is it going to be a Western or is it going to be a steampunk? You know, who knows what you're going to get. I, I prefer it so much better that way myself. So I think that we shouldn't do any putting moratoriums on old man stories or on whatever it is. If we think we've done something too much, you know, I would be against that and I would put my foot down. And you would be under the foot as it came down. Why do you threaten me? <laughs> oh, this was just a friendly discussion. Look what you have done, Mr. Fuqua. You've divided us as friends. <laughs> Starting next week, there will be two podcasts. One is mine and one is his. But until then, I think we're going to just call this good. Thank you for sending <laughs> the story. I mean, is there something... I, I, we could talk a great deal. Before this episode began, we had five or six things that we might talk about. But hopefully I'll just shell those, and in the new year maybe we'll come back to them. Is that this all right? This is the new year, isn't it? Sometime this new year we will come back to them. All right. Because we do have uh, some other stuff that we wanted to talk about, right? Yes. So go ahead and, and roll that, all right, OT. No, no, please. Huh. He's just sitting there. <laughs> I think I made a, a point to be nicer to him in 2009, but look how he repays me. Is he even on? Oh, shoot. No, he's not. Oh. Here. <coughs> ah, there. Hey, roll that 08 OT. <coughs> so, hey, here's a little bit of bonus content for you, Big. Well, it's not for you, actually, because you did it all. But anybody out there who isn't sick to death of our voices, <laughs> we got something special. This week, we are on our chief and most hated and despised competitor, <laughs> Pseudopod. 
Okay, third most despised. Well, actually, uh, I, I believe that's the competitor that you idolize the most. You do have that gigantic octopus poster on your wall that says pseudopod. Oh, and you have those Valentine's Day decorations with the hearts and Alistair Stewart's picture inside of them. <laughs> no one was supposed to have seen those. Hey, all right, OT, good buddy. You, uh, think maybe you could trim that last little comment? <laughs> yeah, he Thank said you. he said he will. Thank you, man. Yeah, that guy's voice soothes me. What can I say? So yeah, we're on Pseudopod. We're reading a story by John Alfred Taylor called "Bird in a Wrought Iron Cage." Uh, it's a good one. So you ought to head over there and check it out. Yeah, that's over at Pseudopod dot org. How the hell do you spell Pseudopod? P P S E-U-D-O-P-O-D. Took me a long time of listening to Pseudopod to learn that. Do you remember when Pseudo Echo put out their cover of Funky Town in the early 80s? Was that early 80s? Had to have been, right? <laughs> so that was a real band. Did you I was find just it... thinking of that the other day. Did you? Wait, what? Have I mentioned Pseudo Echo before? No, I can't remember why I was thinking of it, but I thought of that name and I was thinking, is that like a fake name of a band that they made up for some movie or was that a real band i was leaning towards fake band that's a terrible name well but lips inc <laughs> did the original funky town <laughs> but yeah if you say that fast then it sounds like lip sync cool huh oh wow i had never gotten that well hey you learn something new every day not necessarily on the dune steve but if you leave your home yeah, it's nice to see you out again, by the way. That's right. I really need to check on my shrine to Alistair Stewart and make sure everything's all right. Those <laughs> candles, if even one of them burns out. I think I hear your mama calling you, Rish. You know how we'll record our episodes and <clears throat> there'll be these offensive or extraneous or pointless or idiotic things that we'll say. Yeah. And they end up getting cut out. Oh, right. Yeah. A lot of times that happens. Um, I'd always wanted to somehow share them with our listener. It's it's interesting because I actually do a lot of that too. I mean, we always have that one little outtake that we put after the credits. But usually with each show, there's two or three different uh, outtakes that, that you can choose yeah, from. Yeah, that, that would be just as good as the others. And it's hard to kind of pick which one to, is the best one. Like the Mr. Belvedere thing. No, that was easy uh. to get rid of. Yeah, you've always asked if we could just put them on the site somehow so people that would were interested could just come along and click on them and, you know, make some kind of a widget Whoa. or something like that that we could put those on with. And yeah, I've basically just been stalling, trying to get you to leave me alone. But I guess it's time to give up on that because you don't. Yeah, I can be pretty persistent when sex is not involved. Wait. Hmm. <laughs> You're like, huh. Yeah, you did suffer some brain damage out in the rain. But, uh, yeah, so I finally have given in, and, and I've given it a shot, and I've decided to make some little Easter eggs that uh, people can check out. I, I thought it would be cool to do it like they do on, on the DVD releases that you can get, where they'll have, like, random little things that they look like they're just part of the background, but if you arrow over with your remote, all of a sudden that lights up, and it's something that you can select. And then it goes to some weird little outtake or whatever. So we're going to put some Easter eggs on our website. And this is something that you will just do this one time or you're going to do a lot? No, no, I'll keep doing it. I, I, every week, like I said, there's always extra outtakes that we don't use, things like that, that we could just cobble together into a little file and, and make available for people to click on. So yeah, if you've got time to kill and nothing better to do, then you could cruise around our site and search for these Easter eggs. They're not going to be something that you can see, but if you hover your mouse over the right place, something may appear and you may be able to click on that and, and, and go to a special file that uh, nobody else has heard before. Well, I, do you think we're overselling this? Probably. Because it is just stuff that wasn't good enough to make the show. <laughs> That's true. It's just crap that we had to cut out. But, you know, it's fun stuff. It's it's outtakes. It's bloopers. It's like the blooper reel that, you you know, a lot of DVDs sell themselves with that kind of funny stuff. Oh, dude, on the original Star Wars trilogy, you have to type 1138, you know, and then you get to see the blooper reel. And 
I do that is so priceless, but it sucks having to try and type in 1138 <laughs> at the exact right moment. In fact, what, what is your favorite Easter egg that you've seen on a DVD? Um, I think my favorite Easter egg that I've seen, uh, well, this is probably from one of my favorite DVDs that I've ever had, but Monsters Incorporated um, may have been one of the first DVDs I even bought, but uh, it had a lot of really good stuff in the extra features. They had a, a tour of the whole Pixar's, you know, their new studio that they'd finally gotten. And <laughs> they did it all goofy. Everybody was riding scooters everywhere they went. And there was like weird crap going on everywhere. And there was like a chimpanzee and all the scenes and all this kind of stuff. And there was a, a bunch of interesting Easter eggs that you could come across. But one of them that you come across is like the blooper reel of the tour because this monkey obviously doesn't really work at Pixar. <laughs> and so they have all these bloopers where the monkey is doing weird crap. And, and you know, John Lasseter and every, and Pete Doctor and the guys that are carrying this monkey around are like, oh, oh, crap. What's this monkey doing? You know, or it just does weird stuff and they just crack up. And it was it was funny. I liked it. I don't know. I mean, I'm not a big DVD extras fan. I don't search for the Easter eggs as much as I'm sure you do. But uh... on the first X-Men DVD if you found this Easter egg, there was the scene where all the X-Men rush into the Statue of Liberty. And it was an outtake where Brian Singer shouts, action! And the X-Men start to rush into the room. And suddenly this guy shouts, wait, wait for me! And Spider-Man runs in <laughs> and he joins them. I guess they just dressed one of the crewmen in a Spider-Man costume. But, you know, it cracks up all the actors and I don't know. It was really, really cool. And uh, I, I don't think it was on the later release of X-Men because by then Sony had their Spider-Man stuff. But I just remember thinking that was really neat and would be fun to make out with Halle Berry. <clears throat> nice. So anyhow, check those out. Yeah, that's that's cool that you're putting those on there. And you know what? If nobody appreciates it but me, that's still one more person than appreciated it before. True. And that's already the highest number of people I ever expected to appreciate it so there you have it press the button keep those cards and letters coming folks <laughs> okay well hey let's let them go <laughs> Gotta let them go their way and those Parsec nominated podcasts they've got in their queue right now that's right so it's the end of the show right well almost the end we've got uh, two listeners left okay before they go it's time for you to ask for donations me why me? You said you'd do it. No, I didn't. Did. Didn't. Did. Did. Didn't. Oh, come on. I did it last time. No, you didn't. You just made up a story about fairyland and how you were the queen and you even had a little pixie crown made from dandelions that they placed upon your cherubic head and never even got around to asking for donations. That was the best I could do. Look, if you ask for donations, I won't tell our listeners about how you think Notting Hill is the best movie of the 90s. And you won't watch any Japanese animation unless it has a tentacle rape in it. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and I suppose I won't tell them about when you were 17 and you <laughs> with the <laughs> mayor's daughter and you were <laughs> up there and the <laughs> groper and that <laughs> drug <laughs> and everything was <laughs> and nobody ever found out about it. Yeah, something tells me uh, 08 OT is going to edit that out. But I'll make you a deal. If you'll ask for donations this time, I won't tell anybody how you cried when somebody stole your Paula Abdul cassette of Forever Your Girl. Okay, deal. <clears throat> Folks, we enjoy doing this podcast, and uh, I hope you enjoy listening to it. But it takes time, and uh, it also takes money. We have to maintain the website, and when we first started, we wanted to pay our authors enough money. They choked on it. But times are tough, and we're barely able to cover the pittance we offer at this time. Now, that could all change if you'd be kind enough to hit the donate link at the top of our main page and PayPal us any amount you see fit. We thank you in advance. Heck, even announcer man thanks you. Thank you. Please donate. See, that wasn't so hard, was it? I guess not. Now you'll edit out that thing about Paul Abdul, right? I'll get right on it. Here we go. <laughs> I have been Rish Outfield. And I have been Big Anklevich. And I go walking after midnight, searching for you. Wait a second. Was this a scary song all this time and I never, <laughs> I, I never realized? Good night, folks. Searching for you? <laughs> 
it's like it's, yeah. it's it's about lost love or it's about like a guy who's lost his head or you know it's like there's been a car accident and they never found her head <laughs> and there was a bloody hook on the door handle hey bring back my hook Thank you for listening. Do you have something to say about today's episode? Drop by our website at doonsteef.com and leave a comment. The Doonsteef Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. This means that you can share the Doonsteef with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. You can't drive today. There's ice on the bridges all over the road. You'll kill yourself. Guess I'm stuck here then. They had sex a lot. Yeah, they were very, very happy. Suppose you look back on your life. That's not a bad memory to have. That's what you remember is doing it and doing it and doing it well. <laughs> For shame. Plays now, or whatever. You talked about uh, your music appreciation class. Uh-huh. That fascinates me. What the hell is a music appreciation <laughs> class? And did they cover what we're talking about now, the opposite? Misusing music or pounding it into the ground? Or what, what is a music appreciation class? You had to write papers on a song and why it touches you or moves you? or It, the was, it? it was basically more of a history of music, you might want to say. Pretty much a classical music appreciation class. Oh. I think they didn't figure that they needed to teach you to appreciate rock and roll because everybody already did. I mean, we learned about what time period was the Baroque music period, what was the classical period, what was the romantic period, the modern period, etc. You had, you know, your your Baroque music was really mathematical and precise, and they did a lot of uh, harpsichord and, and string quartets kind of stuff. And then as you moved through the periods, different things would come and brass didn't become a big deal until you get to the romantic period of like you know late life of beethoven and so forth in 1825 on and about bach and beethoven mozart mendelssohn brahms gambleputty but no one remembers johann gambleputty die banausla die winged yeah, it wasn't the kind of thing that you might think of where it's writing papers about why a pop song moves you or something like that. It was mostly learning the kind of things about music that you wouldn't learn otherwise. But it was really interesting, and I'm a big fan of classical music anyways, and especially soundtrack music, which is basically the classical music of our day. I mean, there's not... Maybe there is, I don't know, but it doesn't seem like there's much... Many people out there writing uh, symphonies and whatnot. If you're a classical composer, you go into making film scores, it seems. I don't know. I believe Mr. Holland wrote a rather famous. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to interrupt you about eight times with, like, snoring sounds. and men, You asked, but... so I answered. You can cut most of it out and make it very short. <sighs> yeah, I was really tempted to mention nut hair again there, just oh, <laughs> in case people oh, were falling asleep. Man. You people are pigs!